Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Both. That is Derek Young, and we are getting ready for the Wildcats and the Bearcats on Saturday. A very big game for both teams. This is basically a loser leaves town type of game. The benefit, uh, you think, for K-State at least would be that if they pulled off some kind of miracle in their last two games and were able to beat KU on the road in Iowa State at home, that they would probably still have a pretty strong case uh, with those wins to get into the NCAA tournament. But you look at what Cincinnati has left. They have a game with Oklahoma and a game with West Virginia. So they basically have to win out, I think, to go into the conference tournament feeling like they have a reasonable chance at being an NCAA tournament team. But even that might not be enough for the Bearcats, who they battled hard early on in Big 12 play, but there just aren't enough wins for them. And uh, over the last six games, they've only managed one win, and it came by two points against UCF. They also have, like K-State, a loss to Oklahoma State, except that loss happened at home for the Bearcats. But they clearly haven't quit. They they played to the final whistle on uh, Tuesday night in, in Houston against the number one ranked Cougars. But we'll see what kind of team you get from Cincinnati because – there's not one real standout player for them. It is just a handful of guys that are going to give it to you. And you face a K-State team, then, if you're Cincinnati, that has won two games in a row. And it feels like there's probably some confidence. And this team might be playing the best offense we've seen uh, consistently at any point in the season right now. Yeah, definitely true about the offense. They've scored, what, 80-plus in the last two games. So that that's coming along. Your, your shots are falling. For one reason or another, the shots are falling. Um, you got to find what the formula is there and try to sustain that level of play. Is if look, I don't think Kansas State's going to score 80 points uh, at Fifth Third Arena on Saturday night, six o'clock game, I believe. Yep, it's right there. But if they do, they're not going to lose. So um, let, let's let's shoot for that. You're right. The Bearcats are kind of scuffling. Two teams going in opposite directions. Although, like you said, they haven't quit. Uh, no real reason for them to quit because I don't think they're necessarily eliminated from potentially cracking an at-large bid to the NCAA tournament either. Like you said, it might require a 3-0 finish just because they can't afford a bad loss like the one to West Virginia would give them. And they almost need the other two wins from a resume building standpoint because while they're Computer metrics, numbers, net, all of that is good. Uh, the thing that's probably lacking on the resume, in addition to a sheer number or quantity of wins, is good wins. Um, because even Kansas State significantly trumps Cincinnati in the quad one, quad two department in terms of quality wins and, and what they've done. And really what's really got Kansas State probably like actually within striking distance, which is shocking to many, I'm sure, um, that we're kind of down in the dumps and dwelling on the, the, the stretch of where they lost seven of eight games. And I can understand that that wasn't a comforting scene to watch is that not only do they have three quad one wins and a few more quad twos, those quad one wins are like non-negotiable too, right? Those are you're you're facing, uh, and they because it is sorted by the, the the quad one wins are sorted by the net. You're talking about essentially three top fifteen wins, and when they really grapple the committee, grapple it, and kind of uh, scrutinize some of their decisions and, and really compare teams, sometimes it can get so detailed that they actually not only sort quad one from quad two, they'll sort some quad one from others and almost into like an A or B category. And then that A category being the best ones is like every single one of Kansas State's quad one wins. Yeah, K-State, you, you look at the total body, uh, they're seven and 10 and quads one and two. Cincinnati, uh, just the volume, not quite there. They're five and 10. In those games now, and and that's with Cincinnati not having any more of those left. Their their last remaining quad one game is at Oklahoma uh, uh, next week, so that's kind of a significant part about it. And yeah. you, you know, another thing about where where K State sits coming into this this game with Cincinnati is 
their last real legitimate chance at that feather in the cap of, yes, they have three really good quad one wins at home, uh, but they don't have a significant road win this season, and this would give them a quad one road victory. They're, they have a quad two road win at LSU, but that's the only game in addition to West Virginia they've won on the road in a true road game this year. That's another significant element about this for K-State. Not only is, would it be a quad one win, but it shows the committee that, hey, this team can win on the road. Yeah, and, they, and it'd be Providence in the Bahamas, too. Um, not true road win, like you said, but still away from home because NCAA tournament games are neutral side anyway. So I, I would just throw that into the umbrella or, or the category. And you mentioned it, like 7-10 and 10 for Cincinnati, 5-10 and 10 in quad one and quad two there. Um, and you're not just going against Cincinnati, right? You're also going against what? Wake Forest, Iowa, Colorado, other mobile teams of that ilk. And 7-10, and 10, even if it finished today, probably sits kind of favorably now because their computer numbers are a little weak in general That and, and strength to schedule not always there as well. Then they can't stay has to do probably even a little bit more extra than what a typical team would have. But guess what? They can because you alluded to it. Uh, Cincinnati kind of being – out of quad one opportunities, so to speak. Now they, they may have a chance if they can make it to Wednesday, the NCAA to, or the Big 12 tournament. But Kansas State, assuming they don't play on Tuesday and assuming there's no like giant upsets or, or something crazy doesn't happen, like their next four games are likely all quad one games. Yeah, it's a good point. They're they're well, in a... Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, the, the, KU, they should Iowa finish State out with them. Yeah, because that Wednesday Big 12 tournament game for K-State is going – because that's neutral site, so mm -hmm. it's it's not top 30. It's I think, what, top, top 50. Top 50. That's likely going to be a quad one game, even if it is Oklahoma, who's close on the yeah. border there. Yeah, yeah. But there's only four teams outside the top 50 of the net right now in the Big 12. It's UCF, K-State, Oklahoma State, and West Virginia. All of those would be teams that I don't think that there's a – uh, possible matchup for K-State to get in there. Unless something weird happens and K-State won out or went 2-1 and one and they end up with the seven seed. So there's some weird things that could happen, but in all likelihood, K-State will not play any worse than a quad one opponent the rest of the way, the regular season, and the Big 12 tournament. Now, going into this specific matchup with Cincinnati, we know why it's important, all the other stuff that goes into it, but we've seen this K-State offense start to work a little bit better I think a lot of it comes down to Tyler Perry. The last eight games is shooting over 37% from three. So you have a consistent shot maker. Uh, I thought Cam Carter, he's, he's had a tough couple of weeks here, but one of the strides that he made on Monday night against West Virginia was he got back to knocking down his threes at a decent rate. Hey, when the looks are there, you got to make a couple of them at least to keep the flow of this offense going. I thought Arthur Kaluma's aggression has been back a little bit more. Now we know some of that is matchup based, but the offense is finding a way to get things done, and you're also starting to get some of those ancillary pieces to provide more. I mean, on Saturday, I think you had five guys in double figures for the first time, probably all season for K-State, uh, and then you had four do that against West Virginia, and David Gasson has kind of been back to grabbing rebounds. So with all that in mind, is K-State in a position with this offense to kind of keep this up, or are we going to see a regression and kind of get back to the K-State that really had played over the last month and a half? Well, we'll see. Uh, it's tougher to play offense on the road. I think everybody knows that. Shots tend to not fall as well on the road. I think everyone knows that. So, what, they shot 47% from three on Saturday against BYU. Uh, or 46-47 against West Virginia on Monday night. What was the three-point percentage clip? I think it was still almost 50, right? So it's Pretty good. I'd have to go yeah. look to be sure, but yeah. I think it's in, in that 40s to 50% range. Uh, to do that on the road, <laughs> really to do that any night is pretty fortunate. Uh, to do that on the road, you're very fortunate. So I don't know how much of that's going to translate although they gave up quite a bit against West Virginia anyway, so the gap there wasn't as decisive as it was in the first half just based on the comeback bit by the Mountaineers. But I, what can translate is the the quality of shots. What, what may not translate is how well you shoot it 
just because it's tougher on the road to do that. Yeah, no, that and that's a, a a good point. In case it was 48 percent on uh, Monday against West Virginia, they came up right. one shy of their Big Twelve record at sixteen. So they they knocked him down mm-hmm. and they got him from unlikely places. One of which was Day Day Ames. And I think he's a real key to what K-State has done the last couple of games and what they could do moving forward. I thought, though, in the second half, he was one of those guys that probably played into what Jerome Tang talked about after the game where he said, you know, guys started to play not to lose that game. He passed up some shots that it looked like he was taking in the first half. How important is Day-Day Ames over the final three games of the regular season for K-State's chances to make the NCAA tournament? Oh, very important. Uh, anyone that wants to step up and be an offensive threat outside of Kaluma, Carter, and Perry um, is a welcome sight. Now, he's someone that can generate offense because he's a pretty good ball handler. I I thought the first year would be tough on his shooting because I don't think he was a great shooter in high school, or at least that wasn't the quality that really stood, him out, stood out and made him a true four-star prospect, more playmaker than than – actual elite shooter uh credit to him though i think the work that he's put in the gym the sh- the all the shots that he takes i think he could, has his work ethic and his commitment to his craft will allow him to be a pretty good shooter in college basketball even though he was not necessarily that in high school so but that takes time and you're starting that's why he's probably shooting at the better at the tail end of the season than he was at the you know, at the front end. No, actually, it was hot at the beginning of the year, to be quite honest. But uh, your legs do come and go. So we'll we'll see. Uh, but having someone else threaten the other team's defense is a welcome sign. And just from a capability and skill set standpoint, he's probably that guy. Dave Gasson, not necessarily a gifted offensive player. He needs someone to create for him and basically – give him really good looks near the basket. That's why Marquise Noel was such a blessing for him and to play next to him last year. Uh, the same with Jarrell Colbert, uh, Will McNair. I like they, they're they not going to go out. You know, you're you're lacking some playmaking and star power and, some, and those guys don't shoot threes, so they don't really space the floor either. So out of the ones that could potentially become that perhaps fourth reliable option that can threaten a defense – um, yeah, Day Day Ames is kind of the guy with the skill set to do that. Uh, but I think they knew going in it was going to be tough to rely on a true freshman that was going to have to improve his shot to be able to be that guy. But now that we're, you know, the last day of February creeping into March, that development might be something that's starting to rear its head in a positive way. Now, his decision making was also what was letting this team down, being the source of a lot of those turnovers, getting to bad spots on the floor not understanding the difference between a good shot and a bad shot being open simply, you know, sometimes isn't the end all be all. So he is learning uh, as they go. So he is committing less self-inflicted wounds for Kansas state. And that's almost as good as the, maybe the offensive production that he is creating too, um, being less of a liability on the floor that he once was. And, um, in terms of his defense, though, that's until next year, until another offseason, that's that's probably not something that's going to get fixed overnight um, because he, he's he's basically learning how to be a defender because I doubt he necessarily had to really hone in on that as a high school player. I mean, battling through screens and all that stuff is still even a work in progress for him. One other thing to kind of key in on with these two teams is that there are a lot of similarities between them. Both are not great shooting teams. Both turn the ball over a lot. They are the two worst teams in Big 12 play in terms of giveaways. And that's going to play a big factor in the game because I think it's going to come down to which shooters can be the streakiest and whichever side has more of them, they're probably going to end up on top. Now, one area that Cincinnati has a major edge on K-State Cincinnati is the best offensive rebounding team in the Big 12. As we know, that has been a gigantic weak spot for K-State. They have had a heck of a time trying to prevent extra shots on possessions for their opponents over really this you know, losing streak that uh, went on before the, the wins against BYU and West Virginia. 
Uh, do you think K State's getting better there, or are they going to have to be on high alert again with Cincinnati and their uh, second chance opportunities? Even if they were getting better, and I think it's probably more inconsistent than getting better, it, you have to be on high alert because Cincinnati's not a good shooting team in general. So if you take away their second chances, I mean, that really hamstrings their ability to score, quite frankly, right? Uh, as For as, as much as shots that they miss, and they miss a lot of shots, if you don't allow them to get a second one, I don't know where their offense comes from, to be quite frank. It'll be interesting to see because if you go through and, and you look at some of this Cincinnati, I haven't noted down their worst three-point shooting team in the Big 12 in conference play. They're under 30%. K-State has the best three-point defense in the league. The two-point defense is third. Uh, for Cincinnati, they, you know, they, they're you know towards the bottom again in their field goal percentage. They do a lot of things offensively not very well, and that's kind of where K-State you know, has struggled at times. But I think you feel like K-State is in a better spot right now. And when you look at the K-State roster, I talk about this a lot with what we've seen for K-State playing at different times this year. But you see all these other teams, they have this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy that can go and get you 20 points on any given night and carry the offensive load. For Cincinnati, that really hasn't been something where you can identify that type of player. It's just kind of, man, eh, maybe this guy will do it. Tyler Perry and Arthur Kaluma, they right now are playing back to the level of guys who are going to go out and get the job done for you. And so I think that gives K-State a little bit of an edge offensively, but this is really going to come down to probably what their bigs do in this game. Do you limit the second chance opportunities for Cincinnati and you keep your defense clean enough uh, to you know, not let Cincinnati get hot or you know, kind of take advantage of you in some uh, other spots to get easy buckets. But uh, Ken Palm says it's a seventy to sixty four Cincinnati win. Uh, where do you lean for this game, Dy? Uh, I think. I mean, a large a large part of it's going to come down to those second chance points. I think that would probably be the top key that I would have for this game because, like I said, I don't know how well Cincinnati scores in this one if that's not a component that they could lean on. I, I get I, I think the computer numbers are still stuck with what these teams were maybe a few weeks ago or even a month ago and not necessarily what these teams are now because, like, I get the Kim Palm, the net. I'll be interested to see what the books say because I – like the books might come out similar to that. They're like, okay, Cincinnati six point favorites, and the books are gonna the people that run those lines are gonna look at each other like, do we really want to do this six points based on what we've seen from these two teams? Because even you know before that, I mean, K State hung around with Texas, right? Um, I mean, their last egg was what Oklahoma at home, and that. Yeah, you could maybe argue uh, Oklahoma State on the road right after that, but given the circumstance. Yeah. But it's probably more than like likely Oklahoma at home. Yeah, no, or or maybe the second half against West Virginia too, I guess. But anyway, sure. uh, you played so well in that first half. I, I guess you you take the good with the bad in a way. I, I don't just based off what we've seen from these two teams in the last couple of weeks. It's hard for me to say that Cincinnati is a six point favorite. Like if. If you would have put the opposite on there, case State a six point favorite, not that they should be, but I probably wouldn't have bat too much of an eye. So that's where I come down on it. Yeah, I, I I'm with you. I, I would doubt that when it opens up, this is going to be a six point spread or greater. I think the way things are going right now, it's probably closer. Cincinnati's at home. Uh, they they need it, so I, they'll be the favorite. I would think, but. I think K-State has a real chance of winning this, and K-State is playing like a better team right now. And I want people to understand that at no point this season, like K-State has not been – they they're not a an awful team. Like they have the ability to play at a high level. Obviously, we know that from their three quad one wins that they possess. They played well in those games. They've played well in other games, the, the road game at LSU, the wins over Villanova and Providence. They have the ability to play well, and I think what they've been trying to figure out all season long is with the limited resources they have, how do we do that consistently? And you've won back-to-back -back games. It seems like you might be kind of recapturing that, and as not fun as it was to watch you blow a 25-point lead in the second half, I actually think the, that game getting tight was probably a better thing for K-State moving forward to finish out the regular season 
because I think this would have set up for a really tricky spot if K-State had just finished the blowout of Cincinnati. Uh, I think maybe you start to think more about, oh, hey, we, we're back, we've got this. I think this K-State team has to be mentally sharp every time they go out and they have to be on their toes and feeling like they have to prove something. They have something to prove in this game. Uh, I think K-State, I mean, just the way the trends are going right now and everything going their way, I think K-State does win this game on Saturday against Cincinnati. It's a it's a tough ask. Cincinnati is a good team. Obviously, they're kind of uh, in the boat of going through a, a long Big 12 season for the first time, and so maybe that's catching up with them. But uh, I think K-State is going to be able to get the job done. I, I would take K-State in this game. It might get ugly. It might be like, 69 to like 65 or something or even lower scoring than that we could see a lot of turnovers in this game uh, but I think K-State does pull it out yeah I mean there is capability for this to be perfect to be a little ugly rock fight-ish for sure but these teams have for the most part over the course of what 28 to 30 games struggled to shoot it both of these teams over the course of 28 to 30 games have struggled to carry the ball. And both of these teams over the course of 28 to 30 games have played pretty solid defense. So this could get really, really grindy, uh, the, to be honest. I, like, I'll be curious about the line, especially since places like Kim Baum have it like a five or a six point win over Cincinnati, win over K State. Uh, like, if the line does open at like six, it's probably going to get bet down to three or four. So if you like Cincinnati, uh, I would wait for tip to wait until tip off to take <laughs> Cincinnati. But I also think I would if you're going to take something right away, you might want to look at the total and take the under. Who uh if K State does get the win, who who has the big game? Who's the the impact player at the end of it? Hmm. Yeah, it's, is David Gasson a good answer? I mean, he's Not really probably he's, he's really effective winning. Uh, probably the second most on this team in the last month. Um, probably after Tyler Perry, Arthur Kaluma had a little stretch there where he got a little wonky, had foul trouble against West Virginia. David Gasson's just been a little bit more consistent than him. Cam Carter still trying to get out of his funk. You may have saw the first signs first few signs of that against West Virginia. Um, I thought that was – he wasn't great against West Virginia, but it was his better best game in a while, which is probably saying something. Uh, th those are the ones you, you, you at least immediately think of. The, look, I know he. you look at the stats and maybe he's scoring two, four points, sometimes a little bit more. But the way David Gasson's playing right now, and, yes, he doesn't stretch the four – and yes, I wouldn't call him an offensive playmaker, but he almost gives you a feeling that you might have a big four because he's finding ways to get it done in other areas on a pretty consistent basis. Yeah, David Gasson is absolutely playing better and providing you know good minutes and a good role for K-State, and he's doing it while banged up. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how he continues it because he's given you over the last handful of games good consistency and given you the opportunity – to go out and get something done. I just lean with Tyler Perry. He's on a heater right now. And like I said earlier, it's going to come down to which team has the shot makers in this game. Right now, he's making shots the best out of anybody that's going to be on the floor on Saturday. And, uh, you know, he's he's going to have to probably carry the load offensively again for K-State because there, there's going to be some size stuff that goes on with Cincinnati with the guys inside, maybe Arthur Kaluma. Um, but I, I think Tyler Perry is – we've gotten to this roundabout way where he is the most reliable guy, and I thought at no point during the season would K-State be able to play their ba best basketball with Tyler Perry as their best player. Uh, but over the last couple of games, that's not been the case. He is the best player, and they've they've done some of their best work in those games. So he comes out and makes shots. K-State has a really good chance to win, and we'll see how it all looks come Saturday evening, 6 o'clock. ESPN Plus is the spot. And uh, if you want any of your pre, during, and post-game coverage, head over to kstateonline.com. We'll have it covered from all angles. Uh, the three of us will be at Fifth Third Arena, so we'll be ready to go as the Cats and the Cats meet for the first time as Big 12 opponents. First game between the two sides since the 2017 NCAA tournament. Didn't go very well for K-State.
Yeah. Uh, Jerome Tang said on Thursday, trying to get the days right, just because I don't know when you'll be listening to this. Can't say today or tomorrow. Um, Jerome Tang said on Thursday, not that the loser can't or won't make the NCAA tournament, but he believes the winner of Kansas State at Cincinnati on Saturday makes the NCAA tournament. Um, and he was pretty definitive in that. How do you, how do you feel about that statement? Uh, I, I think he could be right, but I think that the the thing with that is there you'd probably have to do some more work there because here's the thing. It doesn't matter as much as it may seem, but I think it does still hold some bearing. If Cincinnati wins on Saturday uh, and then they say they were to lose out, they would finish 17 and 15. Uh, and be six and twelve in the Big Twelve. I don't think that gets you into the NCAA no. tournament. Um, but I, I, I think I, wonder, I think if K State wins, I do think that there is a more compelling case than people would think for them to be in, even if they struggle down the stretch. I think they'd still have to pick up a win, you know, whether it be Iowa State to finish the regular season or one game in Kansas City. But K State to be an eighteen win team and be at least eight and ten in the Big Twelve. You're with some good wins. You're going to give yourself a strong chance to be on the right side of the bubble. Yeah, I think part of the argument or what he might be implying without saying, and he probably doesn't want to say, is that he believes the winner like the, probably continues to march forward a little bit more too and it adds to yeah. the Yeah, there's because, some momentum play there. Yeah, I, because I'll, I'll be honest, Cincinnati's – they're below K State on the bubble, I think, in most cases, according to a lot of the bracketologists, so to speak. So, I mean, sixteen and twelve, five and ten, like those just those are hard perceptions to overcome by a committee that rarely puts in teams even with those raw record numbers. Like they're not supposed to look at that necessarily, but there is a human element that I think would be hard to overcome. Uh and in and obviously they can't lose like this game alone it's not going to put one of these teams into the NCAA tournament but it puts the winner so close that I can see where he's probably coming from you know in general and, and this and this requires some projection by you in terms of what K State does not just against Cincinnati on Saturday but next week and then perhaps the first game of the NCAA tournament. At this point, do you think Kansas State is marching towards an NCAA tournament berth? I mean, I, if they if they play like they did the last two games and and play like they did for the la, for three of the last four halves, uh, I think I think they are. Uh, and like this team, they have they've played to a level that puts them in a position to to think that they are deserving and earning of it. And I get that, you know, the Big 12, it's not the same 10-team double round robins set up anymore. But at the end of the day, if you win at least eight games in this league, that should mean something. Uh, and it's meant something in the past. I think it still should um, because these these are good teams that you're facing. And I think, like, historically, if you go and look, it's been tough to find teams uh, that, that miss out on the NCAA tournament if they get to at least eight wins in the Big 12. I mean, West Virginia did it at 7-11 and 11 last year. Um, Oklahoma State did get left out last season at 8-10, and 10, but we talked about this on a Sunday show a while ago. Um, oh, that Oklahoma State team didn't have anywhere near the wins that K-State had in their non-conference. Um, I think if you would go and look at that, their best non-conference win was probably against a Wichita State team that, uh, that fired their coach. Um, Meanwhile, K State this year, as we know, they have two wins against teams that are on the you know or on the bubble as well, Villanova and Providence, and they also have some wins in there against teams that you know at the mid major level that are fighting for bids for the NCAA tournament. So, I think there is a compelling case for K State, and I think if they get one more win wherever it may come, um, they have a real chance of doing it. There's just two wins probably does put you in. I I would feel better about that. See, I'm a little bit different. I think they might be to – could be in with two wins, two more wins, and I think three is good. We'll see. I just – if you I win two more, I, I think, think it's tough think, to, to look at a 19-13 and 13 Big 12 team that would have – 
nine wins uh, in in against league opponents. You know, the best league in college basketball. I think it'd be tough to leave that out. I know that like the overall net movement is not going to be there for K State, but you're lying to yourself as the selection committee if you're using the net as the end all be all. At the end of the day, you have to use other factors and. Look, K-State's played some really ugly games, and so that can be your case to keep them out. But they've also played some really good ones, and I think if you look at what they're putting on the floor right now and what they have at other points earlier in the season, uh, this team is better than others that are on the correct side of the bubble. And I think when it comes to teams being as close as they are, like the fact that Villanova is is so close, like if Villanova and Providence were to get in over K-State and the resumes are similar, K State has wins over both of those, and they have wins over they have a win over Providence when they had you know one of their two best players still active uh, with Bryce Hopkins. So I, I just think the case would be strong with two, uh, and probably get you more right than wrong. But I I would not feel great about it. I'd feel good if they won three more games. Yeah, you're at one to two, and I'm at two to three. Two more interesting things to look at that have a chance to directly impact the Kansas State resume in a significant way. And I know it seems very quirky that this matters and and is significant. Villanova is only a couple spots away from being a quad one win, and they have games in front of them that will give them the opportunity to climb into that department. And now it seems a little quirky and weak to for that to kind of backdoor like that, but that's the era of committee crunching that we're in on the other side, you have a a little bit that I bet that is, has Lunardi and Palm and guys like that penalizing Kansas state a little bit is that they technically do have a quad three loss right now because USC did drop enough and USC is now because they played better in the last couple of weeks, all of a sudden only like, I believe at, the time that we're recording this only two to three spots away from jumping back into the quad two category where people don't view those losses as bad. So it'll be interesting if they do that and they have a chance to do that in just one game, because like I said, we're recording this on a Thursday night. I believe USC plays at Washington state. If they were to even compete very well in that game or to win, they probably hop back into the quad two department. Yeah, uh, remaining games for Villanova to to try and boost them into quad one status one for K State. <laughs> uh, they, yeah, they so they they play at Providence. Uh, that game will be on on Saturday as well. That's a noon tip off. Then they play at Seton Hall in the middle of the week, and they finish it off with a major home game against Creighton. So uh, oh, honestly, there's yeah. a chance like root for Villanova, and you might get both of these teams in because Villanova playing well. Certainly helps them, but it also helps K State. I think if you looked at what the you know the consensus bubble teams are, uh, I think you look around and you'd say that there are other teams that are probably worth more to to root against and hope that they struggle down the stretch. Uh, Texas A and M, Utah, Colorado, who I think are good candidates to struggle down the stretch. Same goes for Gonzaga, uh, yeah, Iowa in that mix. Um, and then really if they're in the big East and in the middle of the pack in the big East, that's probably who you're looking for. Uh, I would also say that some of the mountain West schools that yeah. are, uh, in the mix as well, you would look for them to get some bad losses. I grapple back and forth a little bit on how I feel about Providence, just because they're a little bit farther away from the quad one, not terribly far from a quad one chance for K state than Villanova is like Villanova especially with the three games that they have left, like losing any of them is not going to impact their net at all. Winning any of them will. So yeah. that one has real potential. But Providence, they probably need to do some real damage. And and obviously if they lose to Villanova, I don't think a lot of damage happens to them. But can they climb into the quad one? And if they can't, do you just want them to keep losing so they're not a team that you're fighting for an NCAA tournament spot against? I grapple back and forth with that a little bit especially because I think the last game of the year for Providence is against UConn at home. Like, what if they won that? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, Providence will have the opportunity. So Villanova, for those keeping track, Villanova is two spots away from being a quad one game for K-State. Providence is six spots away 
from being a quad one game. And, uh, and, and their remaining schedule is UConn, their last game of the season at home, like you mentioned. They have a home game with Villanova this weekend, like we talked about. Uh, and then they also have a road trip to Georgetown, which won't do anything for them. It could only hurt them. Yeah, so They can't lose that. Yeah, they can't lose that. But I wonder, like, it, it, like it's interesting. This is the stupid way of looking at the net and what it can do to a resume. Like, if you're a Providence, it's like, does it – like, winning at UConn is awesome. But, like, what if your win at UConn helps Kansas State more than it helps you? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, th there'd, there'd be a fair point, especially since they played each other. And, you know, the key thing for, like, why Providence is in such good standing right now, they don't have a quad three or four loss this season, uh, and Georgetown's their last chance for something like that to happen. Uh, right. So they're they're in good shape in, in a lot of ways, and that's why a team like Providence that is somewhat comparable in terms of overall record is in a much better spot than K-State uh, because K-State, they, yeah. have, they have one quad three loss, and then they have uh, – they have a couple of low quad two losses. The the Miami and Oklahoma State ones are going to be real killers for K-State uh, if they end up missing out as well as USC. But that kind of turns it into a whole other conversation that uh, we can probably dive into sometime next week with uh, how gaming the net is hot in the streets right now and what that means moving forward for how a team like K-State should try and schedule things. So we can hop on that and uh, everything else and keep everybody ready to go for the Cats on the road in Cincinnati on Saturday uh, as we will be there and bringing all the coverage. So I would say root for Villanova and definitely root for USC. And cause then things start to really get interesting resume watch yeah. for K state without even having to play. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shout out West Virginia. I'm honoring the Mountaineers for uh, their yeah. service <laughs> on Monday. So congrats to them. I also uh, feel, feel about five seconds here. DY talk about who else you want to win this weekend. And, uh, uh, I've got I've got another surprise for you. Okay, yeah, but and just I would say USC that that that's the important one just to get into the quad two as we said. Uh, Villanova I probably want them to win. If Villanova wins even two of three rather than Villanova doesn't have to win them all. If Villanova won two of their final three games, I think that's a quad one win all of a sudden, and it probably doesn't revert back. I like here's the thing: without even K State playing. What would like Brackenthal just do if Villanova ended up moved into quad one and USC moved into quad two? I'd be curious. It would be interesting to see what the outcome ended up being there. I mean, it certainly like, like that how much does it move the needle? How much does that move the needle? Well, and, and that's the thing too, is like how much of your mind is made up based off of what you see now versus how much of it will happen when all the dust is settled and some of these changes could occur. So uh, while we're on the topic of shirts, if uh, if she would like to let go of my headphone cord so I can uh, flip her around, here is uh, the wardrobe for Elliot Voth today uh, with her her shirt that uh, her grandma, my mother in law, got her. So she is repping the brand today. Uh, I like it. Given uh, you know she good publicity at the Dylan's pickup line and uh, in the drive through getting lunch for everybody today. So. Uh, she's, she's supporting and, uh, oh, she's not happy about something. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Uh, probably cause she's not getting to touch whatever she wants to touch. You good? All right. All right. That, that we're all good all right, for now. She's watching her dancing fruits on the TV, which, uh, Hey Bear is a godsend to, uh, young children. So thanks for that. Thanks to Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. Next time we talk to you, it will be in Cincinnati, the land of fantastic chili, according to Derek Young. He said that, not me. We're out of here. Thanks for watching K-State Online.